Uh, hi everyone. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. I declare Kwazulu Kubane, and uh, welcome to today's session. Uh, uh, I also welcome the panel members: uh, Tabiso, Penny, uh, Rakshika, and Kat, uh, as well as all uh, our students that we, we have today. So, in today's session, we will be covering basic computer skills that uh, you may need as a student uh, in order to survive uh, at university. It's going to be a short uh, presentation. However, should you have questions during the presentation, feel free to use the Q&A uh, box. Uh, the colleagues will assist with the questions then. But again, at the end of the session, we, we will have an opportunity to allow you guys to ask questions based on the presentation. Okay, so I can see that our numbers uh, have dropped a little bit, but uh, it's okay. I hope that we will have a, a fruitful engagement today. So let's start uh, with the business of the day and in terms of what we are going to do. So when we are, we are speaking about a computer, uh, I think it's, it's important to first understand what we mean by a computer. Uh, a computer is a machine that receives information, stores information, and processes information. So any machine that has or that has those three components is regarded as a computer. If it receives information, it can store information, it can process information, then it's a, it's a computer. And here at UK as a 10, we use a lot of those machines. Uh, we have desktops when you go to libraries and your land rooms. Uh, I'm sure you guys also have your, your laptops as well, which are basically computers that that you are going to use throughout your, your life. So let's start with understanding types of computers that we might have. Okay. Uh, the first type of computers that you might have is something that we call supercomputers. So these are computers that are used to process a large amount of information uh, and are used to actually make predictions of huge events in the world. So, uh, for instance, events such as hurricanes, satellite images and navigations, as well as process uh, military war scenarios. So the government will use uh, those super uh, computers. Uh, I'm not sure if some of you know about the World War II, but in the World War II, they had a machine that was called Enigma which was basically a very large computer, but what it did was it used to discern messages that were coming through uh, from enemies and then it would decipher those messages and then tell the Americans and the other countries that this is what the enemies are saying and this is what the enemies are, are planning. So it was a huge computer that was not available to be used by individuals uh, like me and you. The second type of computers that we have is something that is called a mainframe. So these are, they are still big computers, but they are not big as supercomputers. They are mainly used by government and businesses to process very large amounts of information. And then we also have mini computers, uh, which are similar to mainframes, excuse me, but they are used by businesses and government. Uh, uh, mostly they are used by businesses, not government, and they also process large amounts of data for, for businesses. And then we have these ones, which are the most common ones and the ones that we are going to be talking about a lot today, which are called personal computers. Okay, so types of personal computers. So personal computers are basically known as PCs, okay, and they are smaller compared to mainframes or supercomputers, and they are less powerful than any other computers. They are normally used in homes, schools, and small business. They are less powerful in the sense that uh, 
they cannot process large amounts of information at one time. So a supercomputer can process a large amount of information only in one second, whereas if you take the same amount of information and plug it in, in a personal computer, it can take a year to, to even process that amount of information. So personal computers, they just deal with small hunks uh, of, or chunks of, of information. Okay. Let's uh, continue. So there are three types of personal computers. Uh, the common one is the desktop. So a desktop is the one that you will find when you go to the library or when you go to the computer room or computer centers in, in campus. So you will find desktops. There are also computers that are known as portable computers, so such as your notebook, your notepad, or your laptop. So they, they are called portable because you can actually carry them with your hand and walk around with them. Whereas you cannot carry a desktop because a desktop comes with a lot of components. It comes with a monitor, a CPU, speakers, and a, there are several components. So you cannot just go around uh, carrying a desktop. But a portable one, such as a notebook or a laptop, you can actually go around uh, carrying one. There are also computers that are called handheld, uh, such as the one that you see over there. Uh, these are small devices that have been installed with operating systems as well as Microsoft features. And so you can use them uh, 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 as computers. For instance, your cell phone is also a computer because it has Microsoft uh, in it. It also has an operating system that it uses and it complies with the basic features of a computer, which is storing information, receiving information and processing information. All right. We also have something that is called a network. So when you are speaking about a network, you are speaking about a group of computers that share information and share the hardware. Okay. So when you go to campus and you go to the computer room, what you see is a network of computers because all the computers in the in that computer room, they are connected to one another. You can share information in all of them, but they are also connected to the same hardware. So if you wanted to print something, all of those computers, they are sharing the same printer. You will be printing in one of the printers. They are also receiving their internet or ethernet from one source. Uh, and basically, that makes them a network of computers, okay? So like I'm saying, a network is a computers that are connected together. It can be using copper wire or phone wires, fiber optics cables or, or radio waves. Normally what is used uh, at UK as a 10, you'll find that they are using something called a hub, okay? So a hub is something that you connect to an internet source and then it has many ports so you can have port 1, port 2, port 3, port 4, and each port then connects to a particular computer. So the hub is connected to the source, and then you connect each and every computer into that particular hub, and then you get your, your network, okay? Uh, I think that's the most important part, information about this slide to remember, uh, to remember, yeah. So now let's go into parts of the computer or computer components, okay? There are two basic parts that make up for a, a computer. The first one is hardware. The second one is software. So when you are speaking about hardware, you are referring to everything that you can see and touch, okay? Not just see, but everything that you can touch with your own hands. Everything that is tangible is part of your hardware, okay? And then softwares, these are things that you cannot touch, but you can use in a computer. You can see them, but you cannot touch them. They are intangible, and therefore we call them softwares, okay? The hardware is basically, like I've said, 
basically anything that you can touch with your own fingers. For instance, your computer case is a hardware. Your central processing unit, which is your CPU, is a hardware. Your monitor, which is the big screen in a desktop, is a hardware. Your keyboard and mouse, they are also hardware. You also have things like disk drive, zip drive, CD-ROM and DVD. These are also hardwares. A hard drive, a memory for RAM, speakers and printers, these are also hardwares of a computer. Uh, to make sense of the difference between hardware and the computer, you can think of a human being like yourself. Your body is the hardware because we can touch it, it's tangible. But your, your breath, your spirit or your soul, whatever you may call it, is your software. It operates within your body, but you cannot see it, you cannot touch it, and therefore it becomes your, your software. Similarly, in a computer, the hardware is the body of the computer, and the software, it's like the breath or the soul or of the computer. Okay. There are three types of categories that we have when we are speaking about uh, computer hardware. There are hardware that has to do with inputting information, so they input information in the computer. There are devices that are called output devices, they take out the information in the computer. And then there are devices that are called storage devices, that means they just store information in the computer. They do not input it and they do not take it out of the computer. They are just storing that particular information. Uh, what are those devices? So when you are speaking about input devices, we are speaking about things such as your keyboard. So your keyboard, it's this thing that has the letters and the numbers that you use to write in your computer. It's called a keyboard. And then Another input device is called a mouse. It's not a red, but it's, uh, it's this thing that you use to, to scroll around or to go and click on something. It's a small uh, device. So if you look at this picture, number four over there will be your, your mouse. This will be your, your keyboard over there. In a laptop, your mouse and your uh, keyboard, they are one and the same thing. So they are all in part of your of your of your laptop. They are not separate devices such as this one. Okay, we also have touch pads, light pen, such as the one that I'm using right now to make all of these sticks. We have laser scans, pointing sticks, a, a touch screen. If your laptop or your desktop is a touch screen, that touch screen is part of your input devices because you use it to actually process information inside the computer. Scanners, microphone, and joysticks, those are part of your input devices. Output devices uh, in a computer, you are referring to your monitor. So your monitor is the screen uh, that is in front of you, and it displaying, it take, it's taking out information in your computer, and it, it's giving it to you. A printer is an output device because uh, you have a document in a PC that you want as a hard copy, and therefore you can use your printer to actually take out that information in your computer. Speakers are also output devices. They take out the sound, the music, uh, earphones, modem, and faxes. They are part of your output devices. What about storage devices? Uh, the tricky thing is that storage devices are both input and output devices in one. So a storage device is a place to keep data that has been processed so that it can be retrieved at a later time to use again. Such as your hard disk, your floppy disk, CD and DVDs, your magnetic tape and your flash memory which is your, it's your USB, uh, and then there's something else called the jump drive. So all of these are your storage 
uh, devices okay there are other devices that you can use to store information that are not hardware okay maybe we can call those software storage devices okay so something like, like google drive you can use to store your information but it's not a hardware it's just a software or you can use microsoft drive as well or it's called microsoft cloud i think but this is also a device that is a software that can be used to actually store data that you can actually access at a later stage so the difference between the two is that these ones you can touch these ones you cannot touch okay so now that you know all about the hardware what is a software now okay so a software is the programs and applications that tell the computer what to do and how to do it or how to look okay so you have a hardware you have a body without a software it's not living it's not doing anything it's not functioning so you need to put in a software and then the software will now tell the computer what is what what to do and where to look for information and so forth okay so for instance in your computer your hardware your keyboard there is a power button okay the power button switches off the computer and switches on the computer without the software it's just a button even if you press it nothing will happen okay you need something a program that tells the device that if you press that button the computer should switch on or if you press it the computer should switch off okay softwares uh, they are mostly used by computer programmers okay they use them to write codes and instructions uh, okay or computer programmers they write the softwares for us that we end up using to to direct our computers okay the most uh, common programming language that is used to create softwares is the one that is called html so if there are students here who are doing computer sciences or information sciences I'm sure you will come across this term that is called HTML, which is a language that is used to create your, your softwares. Okay. In the next two slides, I'm going to show you how the HTML usually looks like, even though you may not be using it in your, in your studies. So this is how an HTML will, will look like for someone that will be interested in doing computer programming. Now, from the programmer's point of view, this is how things looks like. But from our view as users, this is how things look like. So you go to a website, you have all of these tabs. You have calendars, counseling, learning center, parents, and so on and so on. And if you click over there, the software is already programmed. That if you click on calendar, it should take you on calendar. If you click on introduction, it should take you on introduction. But from the programmer's point of view, it's just this uh, information that is there, which basically tells the computer what to do if you click on a particular thing. Okay. There are two types of software. There is a software that we call an operating system and the software that we call a, an application system. So what are those two things? The operating system is the software that directs all the activities of the computer. It sets all the rules for how the hardware and the software will work together. Okay, it's like the overall software that your computer needs. So examples will be like Windows 7, that's an operating system. The OS, it's an operating system, Windows 95. Right now we are using Windows there is Windows 10 and Windows 11. Okay. Most of you will be using Windows 10 and some of you will be using Windows 11. All of those are operating systems. They tell the hardware uh, how to work, 
they contain all the rules and all the activities and direct all the activities within your, your computer. Without it, your computer will not work. Uh, an operating system has something that is called a command line or a DOS or yeah so a command line that is where you actually go now and tell your your windows that windows this is what i would like to do i would like to open microsoft excel i would like to open app store i would like to open this particular feature and then you use your DOS or your command line to actually type in those instructions and then it will do it for you. For most of us though, simple people like me and you, we do not use the command lines. We, we only click and click and click because there's that option that everything has been put into little icons that if you click and it takes you into that particular thing that you want at that particular time, okay? So this is how a command line with your OS will look like in your computer uh, in case you, you want to use it. There is another thing uh, when you're speaking about uh, operating systems that is called a GUI, which is a graphical user interface. Okay, so that is when we use pictures or icons to represent files, folders, uh, drives, modem and printers, etc. Okay. So these are you were created to make using a computer much easier, more interesting, uh, and non-threatening to inexperienced users. So in a computer, there will be an icon for a printer. So you know that if you click that icon, it will take you to a printer. Okay, and it's much easier and simple uh, if you are looking at pictures rather than if you are looking at at words themselves. All right. So this is an example of a GUI. Uh, I'm sure you can see all of these icons. So this is my computer where everything about your computer is, my documents, you have the recycle bin and so on and so on. So just know that these are called GUIs, graphical uh, user interface. Right. An application software is a program that works with operating system software to help the computer do specific types of work okay so it's a specific software that is only used for a particular type of activity there are six basic types of application software number one we have business softwares such as a word processors for spreadsheets database program so basically your microsoft Office is your business software. We have uh, communication softwares that allows computers to communicate with, excuse me, with other computers, such as your fax software, novel network, AOL, your modem software, and so on. Okay. We also have graphic softwares. So those are softwares that allow users to create and manipulate pictures of graphics such as Photoshop, Print Shop, etc. etc. We also have some softwares that are called edition, educational and reference softwares. So these are programs that help teach new material and ideas and programs that can be used to find information. Okay. Such as Encarta, Workbook, Encyclopedia, Jumpstart, Kindergarten, and Microtype and so forth. There are also entertainment and leisure softwares, such as Warcraft, Age of Empires, Public Design Centers, Pac-Man, and Solitaire. Those are softwares that you use for, for entertainment, okay, to play games and so on. And then there are softwares that are called integrated software, which combines several types of software into one program or package. For instance, Quicken, uh, Spreadsheet, Database, uh, communications reference or, or print shop. Okay, so Quicken is a software that helps you to combine all of these other software such as your spreadsheet, your communication or reference softwares, your, and your graphic and word processor softwares. Okay, so if you wanted to combine them into one software, you can use that particular software. 
here's an example of application software uh, we have Microsoft Office XP we have Quicken 2002 we have uh, the Star Wars games those are softwares as well uh, we have the kindergarten as well that is part of your software application software collection as well all right now for the next part I'm going to ask you guys to uh, do some stuff on your computer so if you, your computer will not was not switched on now this is a good time to switch it on or take out your notepad or your notebook or your or your or your cell phone because I want you to, to show you now some basic stuff that you can do in a computer uh, that will actually help you use computers much easier and much better okay so you will have to to follow me uh, as I go along all right so let's start with the introduction to Windows okay so we are saying that uh, when you log in into a particular computer whether it's a laptop or a desktop the first thing that you see will be a desktop so that's the screen that is in front of you that shows you every information that you need and then inside the desktop you will see things such as icons pictures uh, that present programs that are available at that particular time in your computer okay at the bottom of your desktop you will notice that there is a gray bar and that gray bar is basically known as the task bar now I will stop sharing this screen and show you my desktop so that you guys can understand what is it that I'm talking about okay mm. Unfortunately, I have to end this, this card. Sorry. Just bear with me. So, all of this that is here, okay, all of this is called the desktop or the monitor in other terms, and it's where you will it's the first thing that you will see whenever you open a computer and then these are the pictures and the icons that we are referring to so we have an icon here for FL Studio which is a, a music software for creating music and whatnot we have a, a software for Microsoft Teams in, which means that if I wanted to access Microsoft Teams I just click here we have the icon for Zoom if I click here it will take me to Zoom we have a recycle bin if you delete anything in your computer it will basically be stored in your recycle bin and you can come to your recycle bin and restore it back in case you want to you want to use it again okay and here at the bottom this gray bar this is what is known as your task bar it shows you everything that is open or working at a particular time so you can see here, there is a, a zoom icon that's because I'm on zoom right now so one of the tasks that my computer is doing right now is running zoom there is a PowerPoint icon because I'm also on PowerPoint right now uh, using those slides that we, we were using then my computer folder as well is also open because there are some options there are some documents that have opened there the Internet Explorer is also open because I'm also currently using Internet Explorer uh, the good thing about Windows 10 or Windows 11 it will also tell you the the weather for the day so today where I am it's 27 degrees there is also this error that points up that gives you hidden icons okay so the Bluetooth icon is here the Windows security icon is here and the global protect icon is here there is a shortcut for meet now there's a shortcut for recording there is a shortcut for your internet information about your battery and shortcut about your, your information sorry about 
sound information. So this is what is on the computer, and this is your, your task bar. Now let's go back to the slides and try and see what is it that we have to do next. Okay. So introduction to Windows, locate the following items on your desktop, the task bar, the program icon, the mouse pointer, and the start button. We have already shown you where is the task bar. We have already shown you the program icon. The mouse pointer is this thing that I keep on using to go and click on stuff, which is just a white arrow. Uh, What happened now? Oh, okay, sorry. So there is also something that is called a start button. Uh, so a start button is your is normally your Windows button. So if you look at your keyboard, there's a button that has an I a Windows icon. So you click on that button, that's where you will find most of the programs that you need to use. In your in your PC. All right. Activity. Let's see what do we have to do here. Starting a program. You can start a program or open a program by double clicking its icon on the desktop or right clicking on that particular icon. Okay. The program is visible as a window on the computer screen. A button representing the program appears on the task bar. Now let's go and demonstrate. You can choose any program that is appearing on your screen right now. Uh, that will be okay. But I'm going to demonstrate using one of the programs that is on my screen. So to open this program, I can double click on it. Okay. So if I double click on it, it will just open automatically. But the other option is I can right click on it. So if I right click, I get all of these options and then I can click open. Okay, I will not open it, but if I click open, it will open. If this is a, a document like this one, it will give you an option that says open with so that you can choose an application for open opening the document. So you can choose, it will list all of the applications that can be used to open the document, such as your Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint. And if you click more, these are all the types of apps that you can use to open that particular application. Okay, going back to the presentation. Okay, so working with a, uh, a computer, you can open a program or a folder, like I've shown you how to open a program. You can have more than one window open at one time, meaning that you can have more than one application open at one time. The window that you are working on is called the active window, and the active window will be on top of any other open windows at that particular time. I will show you what it means, but let's see other activities that you can do. So if you're opening a program or a folder, these are the common things that you can use or the common elements that you can use, which are called save, copy, and paste. Okay. So in any application, you can use these common uh, commands, which is to save, copy, and paste. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, apparently, they are now uh, making noise around where I am. Can you just give me one minute to shift where I am and find a quiet place? So, just one minute. I'll mute myself until I find a quiet place. Okay, guys, while Kwasi is 
trying to find a quiet place. I just want to add something and, and give you guys a tip. You know, you will be working with a whole lot of assessments um, and tests and assignments, you know, while maybe at your first year. I know a, a lot of modules have that. So I, I would say that it is important that uh, while you are working um, on your document or file, it's very important to save it. So before you even type a whole lot of content on that document, uh, the first thing that you need to do is to go to the save option and save it, uh, name the document and then save it. Then you can start working on it. You know, because what usually happens is that you guys, you, you are aware that we are in a country where that is highly affected by load shedding. So you might find that you have probably completed three, four pages of your work and then there's load shedding. And if you did not save that file, you might lose the file. So it is important that whenever you are working on a document, you save it immediately before you start working on it. And there is another method that, that I think, I believe Quasi will show you, which is for, uh, you, you can log in uh, on, 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 on Microsoft or on Word uh, with your account, and then it gets saved on the cloud automatically. So if, if maybe you forgot to save, it saves itself. So that means you can always go back and work on, on the document. So these are just the most important things, you know, since you'll be doing assignments and, 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 and so on. So it's important that you learn to save your work before you even start working on, on it. Don't wait to, uh, to, till it's too late because you would lose a whole lot of work, especially some of you will start maybe doing an assignment two, two days before the, the due date. And you may find that you don't get enough time to work on that document. I think Kwasi is back, uh, so over to you, Kwasi. Uh, thanks so much, Tabi. So uh, uh, please pay attention to the tips that uh, Tabi has just given you guys. They are very important, especially the one about saving the documents that you have opened. Because in the past, you meet students uh, that come and crying, saying that I was working on my assignment on last minute and now I can't find it on my computer and the due date has already passed and you find that they didn't save their documents and when they lost the internet or electricity everything they were working on was was lost as well so please take it to to that advice okay I will at the end definitely show you how to open a document and how to save a document uh, so don't worry about it so moving on, uh, if you are using Windows, these are the sum of the, or if you are using a document, these are some of the things that you need to pay attention to. A tightly bar, the minimize and close buttons, the scroll bar, the insertion point, the menu bar, and as well as the Microsoft Word button on the task bar. Now let's go and create a document so that we can make a demonstration of all of these parts. Uh, we have to share screen. Okay. Now to create a document, all you have to do is just wherever you are, whether it's on your desktop or on your documents, all you have to do is click right click and then you go to new, and then it will give you these options. If you want to create a folder, a Microsoft Access Database, an image, Microsoft Word, and so on and so on. So for the purpose of demonstrating today, let's create a Microsoft Word, okay? So once you click create, your document will appear wherever you've created it. The first thing that you need to do is to rename your document so give it the correct name so let's say this is accounting 101 assignment one now it's going to be easier to find my document because i just read the name and then i know that this is the document that i'm using okay now with that option that i used of right clicking and going to new 
it means that your document has already been saved like this so there is no need for me to save it now because it has already been saved but there is another option that students will use to create documents that is you click on windows and then you type word or you type the, the excel if you wanted to open excel or you type powerpoint if you wanted to open powerpoint and then once your word shows like this you click on it and then it will open like that And then you will click blank document. Now this one, because I, I created it using red and blank document, it's not saved anywhere. So whatever I'm doing here right now, it won't be saved. So how do I save this document? Now remember first, remember that Tabby so said that there is a way of actually ensuring that whatever you do on your document is automatically saved on the cloud. You can do that by, if you go to the left-hand corner of your document, there's something called autosave. So if you click autosave, okay, uh, it will give you that option. What it means is that anything that you do on this document will automatically be saved on the cloud now. Okay, anything you do. So even if right now the computer just died on my site without me actually clicking save, whatever I've done up until that point will be saved automatically. The other option that you can use is you can click file. If you click file, you'll get all of these options. And then you can go click save a copy. Uh, in your computer, it might appear as save as, but you still click save as. If you click save as, it will give you these options. Uh, and then you can browse to wherever you want to save your document. Okay. So I want to save this document on the desktop. And then I click save. Now, if I close here and come to my desktop, I'm sure you can all see the document quasi has been saved there. Okay. Now, let's open it to actually talk about something uh, that was on the slide. So, when we want to scroll the document, when you want to scroll down or up, this is the scroll bar. You can drag this huge white bar, or you can click the arrows, okay? Uh, if you want to minimize the document, you can click over there, then the document will, sorry, will close. But if you wanted to minimize it so it becomes smaller, you can click those icons. If you click that icon again, it becomes maximized, okay? If you look at the bottom, there is this negative and plus sign. So if you click the plus, again, it maximizes the document. If you click the negative, uh, it minimizes the document. Okay. And here, these are some of the tabs that you can use to actually organize your document. Okay. So you want to change the font, this is where you go. You want to change the font size, this is where you go you want to make something bold, you want to do italics, or you want to underline something, this is where you go. Now to demonstrate, uh, let's try and use some paragraphs and see if we can, we can demonstrate, okay? So if you highlight everything and come to font and then you type the font that you want, click OK, the font will change. Okay. The common font that is used at UK as a 10 for writing is called New Times Roman. Click on it and then your document will change. Now, if you do not know the name of the font that you want to type, you can just click the arrow and again go to that particular font that you want to use at that particular time. If you want to highlight something, 
So I want to highlight the sentence, you just highlight it, and then you go and click. Sorry, uh, I'm saying highlight, not bold. So you come and this is the highlighter. So you click on the arrow and then you choose the color that you want to use for highlighting. I want to make it bold so that it appear more to the reader. I can go and click bold over there. I want to underline it. I can click the underline option over there and then it will become underlined. Okay. I want to make it in italics. I click I and then it will be in italics as well. If I want to remove the bold, I click on bold again. If I want to remove the underline, I want to, I will click on that icon again and then it will be removed. Okay. I want to change the font size to make it bigger. I can use the number. If I already know, I want to make it to be 20, I can just type 20 there. But if I'm not sure, I can use these arrows to play around. If I click on the down arrow, it changes the font. If I click on this arrow, uh, it goes up. Okay. Now, because remember that I, I, I clicked on auto save, so whatever I'm doing will be automatically saved. But it's always best that every after five minutes, whatever, whenever you are done, every after five minutes, you go and click file and then you click save. Okay. So every after five minutes, you go and click file and then you go and click save. Now, these are the basics uh, of a document. You can use the insert bar as well. Say you wanted to insert a table, you want to insert a cover page. So let's insert a cover page in this document to see how it would look like. Then you have your cover page there, and then you can put in your details over there. Okay. Or you want to insert a shape, you can click on shapes, and then you can choose the shape that you want to insert, and then you come and draw it wherever you want to insert it like that. Okay. There are other tabs that you can use, such as design. If you want to change the color, the background color in your document, you can come to colors. So you can come to page color and then you change the color to whichever color you want. Maybe you want red. Okay. If you want to insert borders, you can also insert borders on your document and so on and so on. But these are just basics. I'm sure that you will get some more time to, to actually practice on your own. Now, let's go back to the presentation and see if there is some things that we can do as well uh, as an activity. All right. Uh, I think I've showed you this uh, on the Microsoft document. I've also showed you this. Uh, now let's talk about the internet or your internet browsers. Okay. So what we want to talk about is to describe the, the function and the components of the internet, how to use the Internet Explorer browser, how to access web pages, and how to print a web page and so on. Okay. We might not cover everything, but we want to know how we can use the internet browser. Okay. So what is the internet? The internet is a worldwide network of computers. With all the, we are speaking about all the computers in the world. They are connected together okay, via the World Wide Web. Okay. So that is the internet. In the internet, you can get current information on almost any topic in the if you wanted to check the weather right now, you can go on the internet and check the weather. It will tell you exactly what is the weather right now. Okay. If you want to communicate with someone who is in America, you can go on the internet and the internet will actually allow you to communicate with people who are 
currently in America. The Internet Explorer is a web browser. So a web browser that something that you use to find all everything about the internet. So if you want to access your emails, you want to access a web browser. A web browser. Now there are many types of web browsers. The most common one are uh, Internet Explorer, uh, Google Chrome, as well as Fire X. Uh, I'm not sure if Opera Mini is still a way available, but Opera Mini is also a browser that can be used. But if you buy a laptop or a computer browser that you have is your Internet Explorer. So what is Internet Explorer? It's a web browser used to navigate through pages on the internet. Web pages are accessed by hyperlinks to typed addresses. A group of web pages uh, owned by an organization is called a website. So if you go in a web browser and then you find that there are multiple pages owned by one organization or one person, that is called a website. Okay. And then the main page of a website is called uh, things that you have to notice or to look for whenever you are using Internet Explorer. Your title bar, menu bar, tool bar, address bar, information bar, and status bar. I'm going to demonstrate these things shortly, but first I want to ensure it is that we just finish with the presentation first, and then I will go and demonstrate how to use Internet Explorer. Okay, and these are the icons that you can find as well on uh, Internet Explorer, how to go forward and, and backward, but we'll demonstrate right now, so don't worry. Okay. Okay, so let's demonstrate how to use Internet Explorer. Uh, So in your task bar or in your desktop, there will be this icon over there. That icon over there is your Internet Explorer, which is now known as Microsoft Edge. I don't know why they've changed the name, but that is your Internet Explorer. So if you click on it, Uh, first, let me close everything so that you will see what happens when you initially click on that page. So if you click on that icon, it should take you on your Internet Explorer or your Microsoft Edge. So let's wait a minute up until it loads so that we can... try and understand what's happening, okay? So you have the title bar. The title bar is this one, okay? That tells you the website that you are in. Right now we are not in a particular website. We are just on Internet Explorer. So the title is just you tab, okay? But if you click on something such as Google, for instance, then the title bar will change to, to Google over there. Okay, let's, let's stop because it will take long. That you can use to go forward or go backward. So say you have multiple websites that are opened in one moment and you want to go back to another website that you, you were using previously, you can click here and then it will take you back. Right now, these errors will not work for me because I do not have any websites that are open, okay? If my internet is slow and whatever I've clicked doesn't work properly, I can refresh that particular page that I'm on by clicking the refresh button over there. Uh, sorry guys, I was kicked out of the meeting. 
let me copy it to where I was. So I see saying this is the address bar, so I can type on this address bar the website that I want to go to. So if I want to go to UK the 10 uh, website, I can just type UK the 10 website and then click OK, and then it will take me to UK the 10 website. Alternatively, uh, I can use this option over there and then type the website that I want to go to. If I wanted to add it into favorites bar, I can also add it to favorites bar or favorites folder right there. Okay. Uh, here, I want to point out to these three dots over here. So if you want to make changes or set up your website to look in a particular way, you can click here and then you'll find everything that you want over there. Again, there's the scroll bar here that you can use to scroll down and everything. And then there's this bar over here which shows you all of the websites that are, are available to you. Firstly, these ones that appear here are the websites that I've used often on this computer. So whenever I use the website, maybe for more than three or five times, Internet Explorer remembers it and then puts it as a shortcut here. So now if I wanted to go to the first year experience page, I just click here because it has been saved automatically by Internet Explorer. Uh, and then these are also other websites that uh, we, we can use for, for information and so on. Okay. So I think that's it about the Internet Explorer and what you need to use and how to access it and how and the options that are available for you to actually navigate yourself on Internet Explorer. With that said, I think we have come at the end of my presentation. Uh, and I'm really sorry about the noise. I wasn't aware that today around the office they'll be doing some cleaning outside and so on. So it's kind of noisy. But I hope that you, you all have had me yeah, and picked up the most important points on my presentation. With that said, I'd like to give the opportunity to my colleagues, Prim and Stabiso, if there are comments or additional information that they'd love to, to take you through, guys, or if there are questions that they'd like to answer from the Q&A box. Uh, Prim and Stabiso, over to you. Thank you, Kwasi. I just want to say again, thank you for the wonderful information. Lots of things the students need to experiment and explore being on the internet. It's like driving a car. So everything you've discussed today and elaborated upon, students are encouraged to play around on the internet, to play around with all the um, apps and get used to how to work and become digital natives for the future. Because the world of work requires you to really be accomplished at how to use the internet uh, resources and the IT resources. Thank you, Stabiso. Over to you. Thank you, Kwasi. Uh, thank you so much, Prim. Y yes, I agree with Prim on that. But also, I just want to give you guys a heads up. Uh, obviously, you know, most of the work that was discussed today you will probably find it in your ISTN 101 test one. So it's very important that you, 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 you play around with these things because uh, ISTN is, is a practical subject, so a uh, module. So most of the work that you've been taught um, is examinable. You need to know it because you know when you're gonna be working with the computers in the future, you need to know these things. So this is very important. It wasn't a waste of time. I wish more people were here, uh, or maybe probably they are also watching on YouTube so that um, they can see some of the things that are highlighted here because they will also form part of the curriculum that you'll be taught uh, in semester one. So I encourage you to start practicing, play around it, especially if you are like me, you came from a background where you, you had never seen a computer in your life. This is your chance to learn. Um, it's quite basic and quite simple, but then 
if you don't practice, you never become an expert. So I encourage you all to really, really take everything that was learned today into heart and because you're going to need it in the near future. Um, also, please ensure that you are checking your emails and ensure that you are attending your lectures as well, because uh, this information is also gonna, going to be discussed in lectures as well and, um, and in practicals. So you need to attend almost every, uh, in fact, or attend everything as a, as a first year student um, so that you can get exposed to this information. Um, I think that's all from me. Uh, Kwasi, um, I think I can hand it back to you. Uh, but, but before I do that, maybe uh, I just need to look at the chat box. There's one question that says, part of the FYE course on learn is to submit a YouTube video. Is this compulsory? Um, everything that is on the FYE site is important. So you need to complete all the activities that are there. They are not there because um, you know you just need to ignore them. They are there so you can complete them because they will teach you one way or something one way or the other. So please complete everything. If you're supposed to upload a YouTube video, you need to do that. Um, it is important um, is for you to do that, Natasha. So thank you for that question. Every single activity that is there is for you to complete. So you need to take your time and complete those but also make sure that you are also balancing in attending the, your lectures and, 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 and also your tutorials as well. We will, we, that will start in, in probably a week's time. So thank you so much Kwasi for a wonderful presentation. And I hope everyone who was part of this meeting or part of this session has learned a lot and they will go home and start working on, on, on and playing around with, with these things. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thanks so much, uh, colleagues. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think you've, your your emphasis is very valid, and I'm sure students will will take your advices more seriously. Uh, if there were students who missed some previous sessions, so the sessions that we had from the 10th of February, and actually from the 7th of February. So there are links on the chat that you can go and click and they will take you directly to all of the sessions that we have had in the past. And also, if you still need more information about what we are presenting today, you can just go on YouTube and then you type uh, basic. So you want to know about how to use Microsoft Word, you just type basic Microsoft Word skills or basic Microsoft Excel skills and so forth. And also, you will find this information on your ISTN course, like Mr. Mkonza has actually said. Uh, I don't see any questions on the chat. Uh, and I have seen that all the questions that are on the Q&A box have been answered, except for one which says, good morning, I hope you are all well. What is the procedure in order to receive a laptop from NSFAS or the university? So if you are a first time NSFAS recipient, uh, part of your NSS package is for you to receive a laptop. So that's automatically done to you, it will be allocated to you automatically. There is no application procedure that you need to follow. The question would be, so how do I get the actual laptop, okay? So for that, you will receive communication from ICS when the laptops are available. And then ICS will give you options in terms of how you can acquire a laptop, okay? Uh, it can deliver it to you. I know that's one of the options. Another option that was used in the past is that they give you a number that you can go to a particular shop and then represent that number and then the particular shop will give you the, the laptop because ICS have already purchased the laptop for you in that particular shop. Another option that was used in the past was to actually, ISTN will actually invite you to come on campus or you will pick that option for yourself and say i will come on campus and get my my computer so yeah so you just have to wait until the computers or laptops are available from ICS, and then they will let you know how you can acquire it okay i i sent another question says i sent my bank details to the howard please email when will i get feedback or receive 
allowances. Okay. Uh, colleagues, does anyone know when uh, NSPAS allowance is taking place, especially for, for this month? Um, what I can say, Kwasi, is that I think the student, what is important is that the student has done their part. So now what's going to happen is that the information will be captured on the system. Once it has been captured, uh, uh, they will receive the allowances. So for instance, if you've missed, you've already missed the cycle um, for, for this month, you, you, you don't have to wait until the next cycle to receive your allowances. They will actually just um, uh, process your allowance as soon as the information is, is, is available. So you, since you've done your part, uh, all you can do now is wait uh, for your allowance and uh, um, allowances to to reflect in your bank account. Um, we cannot say we cannot be specific. We cannot tell you the date. Um, all we can say is that once you've done your part and you've sent in the uh, documents, then you will receive your allow your allowances as soon as possible or as soon as your information has been captured. So please be patient with that process as well. We don't work for the department, so we are not certain about the dates in terms of whether information is on the system or not. So all you can do now is just to be patient. Uh, thank you so much, Tabiso. Uh, uh, yeah. So another question says, here is the question, how you connect your laptop uh, on the internet? So basically, if you want to connect your laptop on the internet, it's, it's very easy. Uh, I'll just show you right now. So on your desktop, I'm sure you remember this, we talked a lot about it. If you go to your taskbar, there's this internet option there. So if you click on it, So if it's UK, it's 10 Wi-Fi, you just put in your student number and your LAN password, and then you'll be able to use UK as 10 Wi-Fi. But for me, I'm using my cell phone because it's faster than UK as 10 Wi-Fi where I am. So I've used the details that I have. Uh, okay, thank you, Kwasi. Um, I think another thing that is important, I know that someone is probably at rest right now and they are struggling to connect. Um, now with UKZN Wi-Fi, you cannot connect if you do not have Global Protect in your device. So you need to install Global Protect in your device. And once you've connected, like how Kwasi was, was saying, mm. and then you need to also connect on Global Protect and then um, it will actually uh, uh you, you'll be connected to the network so let me just show you my screen quasi if you don't mind um you know i'm i'm working with a few documents but it's fine I'll, i'm just going to 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 go into my screen very quickly and show uh, the students what i'm talking about so don't mind the the document i'm working on as you can see this here this is the global protect so you can go uh, into this and then probably connect. And there's gonna be UKZN Wi-Fi here. You connect, you put in your details, like Kwasi was saying, and then it will still say no internet. Then the next step will be, once you, you've installed Global Protect, then there will be this a small little logo or small little um, yeah icon that you need to click on and, and click connect. So for this again, uh, we, I think we showed you guys in the beginning, you, feel you need to, um, uh, uh, put your details there. You start by finding the, the, the network. So it's it's vpn2.ukzn.ac.za. And then once you, then you click next, and then it will put you into a, 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 a it give you an option for you to put your details and then you'll put your student number. Then you'll put your password, uh, your LAN password. Once you've done that, and then you're gonna press and, uh, and click and say here, and then it's gonna say connect. Uh, once you've done that, and then you will be connected, and this will be like this, and it will say connected like this. Uh, once you've done that, then that, then you are fine. You are able to um, continue with your 
with 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 the with the connection. So th there's just that little small um, trick now. Uh, I think it's it was introduced recently. Now uh, uh, global protect, like we've mentioned to you guys, it it saves up mm, uh, that data. So uh, UKZN is now using it as an option also to save data because there's a whole lot of people who connect into this um, Wi-Fi. So uh, you're gonna you're going to need to uh, uh, add that option there and connect via Global Protect. There's also ways that you guys need to know when maybe you're at home, you can hotspot your, your laptop using your device um, or, or using your cell phone. Obviously, you will get maybe to know that as time goes on because I don't have your cell phone, so I can't show you. But you can actually hotspot the laptop, connect, and then click Global Protect, and then it, you'll be, you'll be uh, connecting on the network using your cell phone, even if you don't have a router around you. And also, I think people that are using, um, for there's a trick that I must teach you guys. If you are using telecom, maybe as your network, it's actually way, way cheaper to, 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 to connect. Um, you know, even if you don't have data, let's say you don't have daytime data, you have zero megabytes, you can still connect on the internet and do everything that you want to do. So uh, as long as you have maybe weekend data or night nighttime data, it, it, telecom is that option of allowing you to connect with your nighttime data during the day. Because as we all know, the daytime data always runs out first, and then you are left with nighttime data because your data consumption uh, during night at night is not as as frequent as as during the day. So you are actually able to connect using that option as well. Um, you know, with, with telecom though, I think with the other networks, if your data, uh, data is depleted, then there's nothing you can do. But with the telecom SIM card, you are able to connect, uh, on, but you, what you need to do is just connect, hotspot yourself, and then connect with Global Protect. It will still work, even if you don't have daytime data. I don't know if that made sense, but um, I think it's something that has been helping me a lot as well. So I'm hoping you guys will also benefit from it. Uh, thanks so much, Taviso. Uh, it does make sense. Uh, yeah. So please, guys, follow Taviso's advice. If you are still not sure of how to download and install Global Protect, you can request from one of your mentees or your mentors to actually send you the guide, the step-by-step -step guide in terms of how you can access Global Protect, or you can go directly to your ICH uh, and then click on Global Protect and then it will also give you the step-by-step -step guide on how to install and download Global Protect. Uh, the final question that we have is, I have my own laptop, will the university upload the necessary software, uh, i.e. that allows me to use RAID, etc. Okay, so whenever you buy a laptop, it already comes with Windows. So the only thing that you need is to install Microsoft uh, software so that you can be able to use your weight and, and everything. The good thing is that at UKZ10, you can, you can use the UKZ10 license from Microsoft, which means that Microsoft will be free to you. So how do you access uh, Microsoft and install it in your computer? You just go to software rep.ukz10.ac.za and then it will take you to this page. Before it takes you to this page, it might require you to log in. So you log in with your student number and your LAN password. And then those are all the softwares that we have. And I'm sure that you can see here that we have Office 365, which is Microsoft 365. So if you click on it, the download process will, will start automatically. And then you'll for just be following steps uh, in terms of uh, yeah, or, or of downloading Microsoft. And again, there is Global Protect, so on software repository, again, you can download your Global Protect and install it there if you already know the step-by-step -step guide. You can also click on academic software. That's where you'll find the softwares that are used to do analysis, like your Stata, your SPSS, your Grammarly, your EndNote, uh, which is your reference and software, you can also find it here, and then just click on download and install on your computer.
Uh, thank you so much, Kwasi. Just one more thing. Uh, also, if you are on campus, um, you can walk. There is an option to walk a walk-in center for ICS. So you can walk in and, and get these things uh, installed in your personal computer, even if it's not a, co a laptop um, that you're given by the university, even if you bought it yourself, you will still receive the service because you are a UK student. So even if your, your, your laptop crashes, you just take it there to the ICS. They are specialists there that actually will diagnose it and, and probably fix it for you. You don't need to take it to town and end up getting marked and all those things. Um, you know, so it, 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 the, the ICS department is there for all of that. So if there's something that you don't, you're not, you don't understand when it comes to your laptop or you're struggling to connect with the laptop, you need to go there uh, to the ICS working center for student. And then you can, um, you can get your laptop fixed. They'll probably keep it for a day or two if the, 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 the issue is serious or if it's just a minor issue, they will just help you right on the spot. So that is an option there that you also have a, as a student, because I know some of you maybe might not be familiar with some of these things as yet. So you will need someone to help you and guide you. Uh, considering the NS, the, the laptops for NASFA students, um, you, 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 yes, you, you, are, you are actually notified to come and collect a laptop. If maybe you did not, you were not notified, you can still contact your financial advisor. Um, we have our college financial advisors, uh, Mr. Gasa and, and Mrs. Raj Kumar. Uh, they, you might not get a notification simply because your budget has not been adjusted into someone who is in need of a laptop. So you just send them an email and notify them that you need a laptop and they will adjust the budget. And um, in about a week or two weeks, then you will receive an SMS saying, you can now come and collect your laptop. So um, it is quite a simple process. Um, you just need to notify the, the college advi the, um, a financial advisor so that they can adjust your budget. If you need the email addresses for Mr. Gasa and Mrs. Rajkumar, I will just put them in the chat so you can have them also with you. Thank you, guys. Uh, thanks so much, Tabiso. Uh, I think uh, that was the last question that we had. So I want to thank you, firstly, students, for attending and always showing up in this session to show that you are actually serious about your academic life and actually settling in well in UK as a 10 and starting your UK as a 10 gen. So well done. Keep it up and also encourage others and your friends to actually come and attend these sessions. We will have another session on Friday. Uh, so please go on the FYA page and register for the Friday session. And also thanks to the panel members as well as the organizers, uh, Rakshika and Kat. We thank you so much. Uh, with that said, may everyone have a lovely day and enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kwasi. Bye.